modern day people, quote unquote civilized people, don't understand anything about child sacrifice or animal sacrifice or why it was a commonplace integral part of the culture back then. It, it was a spiritual thing that people did. Abraham identified a time in his life where he needed to be close to ego death. And uh, the most authentic way to do that is actually to be close to death. And uh, when animals were sacrificed, you know, slowly looking into their eyes, you know, burning them and letting, letting, just making a huge uh, divine deal out of it, that brings you closer to death and uh, puts you in a state that's more appropriate for making decisions. Uh, I think that Thomas Jefferson or somebody said that when a man, uh, you know, faces death because of his decisions, that's when things become most clear to him. Is he really in this 100% or, you know, uh, being put to death is the ultimate, like, it's the ultimate distinction. So if you know anything, you know it at that point. And Abraham was oof, the foundational prophet of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. So he probably, uh, in some sense, knew what he was doing. I mean, psychology is an, an incremental process, like brings on a tree. And that although people back then were probably as intelligent as we are now, pretty much, the level of development that their culture was at, and even the individual psycho brain thing was at, was likely maybe less. Like Julian James has this book and this theory called the uh, bicamorality of consciousness or something, and the, there's this thing about how a long time ago, if you read books like the Iliad and the Odyssey and even before that, it becomes apparent that the people have no self-talk. They don't think recursively. In any point in time when self-talk, recursive thinking, or, or so-called free will would be involved, it's actually a, uh, a god that has that talk. And there's these polytheistic gods like Athena or whatever that discuss these issues. And the people are merely pawns or players in the discussion that the gods are having when really it's the people that are having the thoughts but when but the people project the thoughts onto a god and julian james thought that uh the bicamerality of the human brain might have had something to do with it that there's this lateralization there's a space that's opened up right in the middle of the brain and as one side of the brain tries to talk to the other side and they connect and there's this thing called the corpus callosum, language appears in your head almost like this mystical Greek logos, like the same one that Terence McKenna talks about. There's also this concept of genius back in the, in the Roman and originally in the Greek times. Uh, it's the idea that there is this, this like spiritual entity that imbibes you with creativity. When you do something creative uh, today, we're like, oh, that person is so great. But back then, they thought that there was this like munchkin spirit called the genius that was giving you things. And if you didn't, if you weren't that creative person, well, your, your genius just wasn't giving you good stuff at that time. So don't worry about it. God is more often than not the projection of a person's highest sense of knowledge, which isn't necessarily true, and can change depending on how the context of the situation changes. If Abraham got close enough to death, staring into his son's eyes as they both know that, you know, Abraham will kill his son, and everything is on the line, Abraham walked hundreds of miles through the desert to found this community out there where everybody was like spiritually tied to this new 
sense of awareness. So they're there. What if Abraham actually attained the level of spiritual knowledge that he needed to be sure about whatever he was going to do in the future? And because of that, it, he didn't have to kill a son anymore. He got to where he wanted to go. And there happened to be a ram right there in the bushes. And it's interesting to note, if I didn't say this already, that when Abraham was walking up the mountain, he told Ishmael or whoever was there with him waiting down at the bottom of the mountain, we'll be back. Uh, both of us will be back. Now, it, uh, Isaac doesn't come back with Abraham, but it is said that Isaac lived and uh, lived a long life. He became blind later in life, something about lentil soup. Uh, yeah, animal sacrifice, child sacrifice, Jesus, I just want to mention again that was God's plan really to have uh, Jesus die for humanity, or was it that humanity sacrificed Jesus as a scapegoat for their own sins, to blame them all on this one person, and to somehow uh, have a extended moment of realization afterwards, wow, we are a bunch of fucking idiots, we just killed this great person that showed up to try and teach us wonderful things about the obviously simple things about how we should treat one another with love and respect, etc. You know, and regardless of who Jesus was, the symbol of what happened is who and what Jesus is. There's a rabbi, a couple of rabbis that, when they talk about the binding of Isaac, they say, guys, remember that the Semites sacrifice children all the time. And that this, is a huge, this story is a huge deal because it's God telling Abraham not to sacrifice Isaac. That was a normal thing to do. If you look in the prayer stories, it happens a bunch of times. A bunch of the kings sacrifice their firstborn sons in the name of winning some kind of war. But that's, uh, that's that. That's, did, I, did I say everything? You know, I hope so. I hope I stimulated your mind and you didn't zone out because this is some arbitrary religious story that doesn't apply to you and happened thousands of years ago.